So today I'm going to give you a quick introduction to three related topics in excitatory and inhibitory networks. Um, it's just going to be a quick taste of each, and you'll see references to the original papers for more depth. So the first topic is inhibition stabilized networks, or ISNs. And the story begins with surround suppression in primary visual cortex, V1, in this case of the cat. Um, neurons in primary visual cortex are selective to visual stimuli in a particular region of the visual field called their receptive field. In this case, about a two degree diameter region for this neuron being recorded. Um, <clears throat> and in this case, we're seeing an uh, optimally oriented grading and it's drifting, it's moving across the receptive field, this two degree patch of this neuron. And when the light is over the light preferring regions and dark over the dark preferring regions, the neuron responds well. So when we look at the average firing rate as a function of time across one cycle of the drift of this drifting grading, we see that in the appropriate parts of the cycle, there's a nice strong response. However, the region surrounding the receptive field, called the surround, stimuli there don't drive the neuron, but they can suppress responses to center stimuli. And so when we expand the stimulus into the surround, a 20 degree diameter stimulus, you see the response is strongly suppressed. That's surround suppression. And the surround suppression depends on the center and surround orientations being matched. So the usual picture of how surround suppression happens is that the surround stimulus is stimulating neurons in visual cortex that are millimeter, millimeters away from the neuron that's being driven by the center stimulus that you're recording from. And over that distance of millimeters, the main connections in visual cortex are excitatory connections. And so the belief is that excitatory projections from those surrounding regions of cortex are projecting into this local region of cortex of the neuron you're recording from. And since they cause suppression, they must be primarily driving inhibitory neurons. And so naively, this would predict that surround suppression involves an increase in the inhibition that a neuron receives. It gets suppressed by getting more inhibition than it had when it was only seeing its center stimulus. However, that turns out not to be the case. And in this uh, work from uh, Hirofo Miyazaki and David Furster, during surround suppression in CAT-V1, both the inhibition and the excitation that cells receive decrease. So what you see here is the excitatory conductance, delta GE, for an optimal stimulus and for a large surround suppressed stimulus, and the inhibitory conductance, delta GI, for an optimal stimulus and a large stimulus. And in both cases, you see the points lie primarily below the diagonal, meaning there is less inhibition and less excitation to the large stimulus than to the small stimulus. Um, and so our interpretation of this is that this is the paradoxical response of an inhibition stabilized network that was first uh, pointed out by Misha Sodix in a paper in 1997. And this works as follows. So we imagine this scenario. And so <clears throat> we imagine we're going to model just a population of excitatory cells and a population of inhibitory cells connected to themselves. Oops. connected to themselves and to one another. Um, and uh, we imagine we have on the center stimulus, and so the neurons are firing, they're at a fixed point level of activation for that steady input from the center. And now we're gonna add the surround. Now the surround is gonna go to both excitatory and inhibitory cells, but for simplicity, let's consider that it only goes to inhibitory cells. So the center stimulus is on, we're at the fixed point for the center stimulus, and we add the surround stimulus. So what happens is the, that raises the firing rate of the inhibitory cells, which increases the inhibition to the excitatory cells, and so they lower their firing rate. And that decreases the, in, the excitation to the inhibitory cells. So we've added excitation to the inhibitory cells, we've decreased excitation to the inhibitory cells, which is gonna prevail? Well, the key point is this. Suppose that the excitatory subnetwork is unstable by itself. What that means is that if we froze the inhibition at the fixed point level, we don't let the inhibition dynamically respond to changes in the excitatory firing rate. Then if the excitatory firing rate ticked up a little bit from its fixed point level, it would recruit too much recurrent excitation. And so it would keep going up. And if it ticked down a little bit from its fixed point level, it would lose too much recurrent excitation and it would keep going down. But normally the dynamic response of the inhibitory population to those changes stabilizes the, the fixed point. So if the excitation is unstable by itself, if you're an inhibition stabilized network, you're stabilized by the dynamic inhibition, then that means that when the excitatory firing rate has fallen, the excitatory population has lost too much recurrent excitation to sustain that lower firing rate. It wants to keep falling. And not only that, but it has more inhibition than it did at the fixed point. 
So too much more inhibition, too little excitation. The firing rate is in free fall and it's going to keep falling. There's nothing to stabilize it until the withdrawal of excitation from the loss of recurrent excitation onto the inhibitory cells is bigger than the excitation we added to start the process. At that point, the inhibitory cells are receiving less excitation than they were at the fixed point, and so their firing rate is going to drop down below the fixed point level. And now you might think, well, now the excitatory cells are receiving less inhibition at the fixed point, so they're going to go up and we're going to have an oscillation. But no, remember that the excitatory cells have lost too much recurrent excitation to stabilize that lower firing rate. The only thing that's going to stabilize the firing rate is either if it gets a new source of excitation or if it has less inhibition than it did at the firing rate to, at, the, at the fixed point to, to compensate for the over loss of recurrent excitation. And that's precisely what has happened. We, it has a loss of inhibition. And so this is now the new steady state of the, of the network. The excitation is stabilized by the loss of inhibition. The inhibition is stabilized by the loss of excitation. And this is the new steady state of the network. And so excitation and inhibition have both decreased through addition of excitation to the inhibitory uh, population. And this, that's what Misha Sodix called the paradoxical response of the inhibitory neurons, that they would lower their firing rate in response to uh, increased input. But the, the, the key thing, this might be a complicated set of neurons, and some of them might go up and some might go down in their firing rate, but the key thing, as you've, you should have seen from my explanation, is that the inhibition that the excitatory population receives has to be paradoxically decreased compared to the fixed point. So if you add excitation only to inhibitory cells and it causes the excitatory rates to go down, well, they lose too much recurrent excitation, so the inhibition they receive has to paradoxically go down. And that's the robust result. So the intuitions you should get for the inhibition stabilized network are that input to inhibition that suppresses excitatory cells will drive down both the excitation and the inhibition those excitatory re cells receive if and only if the excitatory to excitatory subnetwork is unstable by itself. Um, and you can see a null client analysis of this in the optional part of the tutorial. So surround suppression is not due to an increase in inhibition. It's a suppression, but not an inhibition. It's due to loss of excitation. So it's a deamplification. The response was being amplified by recurrent excitation. That recurrent excitation is being withdrawn, and so it's a deamplification is the cause of the suppression. So what kind of amplification is it? Well, it's what we call balanced amplification. And that's the next topic, the second topic we're going to address today. So consider the following simple network. We have, again, the excitatory population, the inhibitory population, and they're making connections uh, to themselves and to each other. And we assume a particularly simple form of the connections, namely that the two excitatory projections are identical and the two inhibitory projections are identical. So here's our equations uh, for the dynamics. And we're going to assume, for simplicity, a linear network. Think about being linearized around a fixed point. So we're describing the dynamics close to that fixed point when we added the uh, surround input. Um, and uh, we can write this as a vector and matrix equation where the connectivity matrix is uh, this is the E to E connection, this is the I to E connection, this is the E to I, this is the I to I. Uh, the rate vector is the E and I firing rates, and the input is the E and I inputs. Well, so how do we analyze what happens in this equation? Well, the matrix W has two eigenvectors. Um, one of them is proportional to the 1, 1 vector. And you can see if you multiply this by 1, 1, you get W times 1 minus K1 times KI times the 1, 1 vector. So that has eigenvalue given by this lambda 1. And the other eigenvector is proportional to ki1. And you can see if you multiply this, uh, this eigenvector by this matrix, you get 0. So that has eigenvalue 0. And we're going to assume that ki is greater than 1, so that lambda 1 is less than 0. In other words, the inhibition is stronger than the excitation. So if we now write the uh, rate vector as a linear combination of these two eigenvectors, and for simplicity, let's consider the case with no external input. Then we can write down the solution. It's very simple. The two components each just monotonically decay from whatever their initial condition is with a time constant that's determined by their eigenvalues in, in the form that's shown here. And so each eigenvector component decays monotonically to zero. So you would think that the 
length of the rate vector shrinks monotonically to zero, but it turns out that's not the case. What actually happens starting from the init an initial condition where the excitatory firing rate is one and the inhibitory firing rate is zero? Well, looking in the eigenvector basis, here's the E1 vector proportional to one one. Here's the E2 vector proportional to Ki1, where Ki is bigger than one. They're very close to each other. And so in order to represent, the, our initial condition is over here, the excitatory firing rate is one, the inhibitory firing rate is zero. And in order to represent this initial condition, which is very poorly represented by the two eigenvectors, it's off in a different direction, we have to have a very big component in the E1 direction and a very big negative component in the E2 direction, and they're canceling each other to make this very small initial condition. Well, now they each monotonically decay, and time is shown in color. Uh, so this here's the monotonic decay of E1. Here's the monotonic decay of E2. But E2 is decaying faster than E1. So after a little while, this is decayed away. It's no longer canceling E1. And so the rate vector grows up towards E1. And then finally, uh, it gets small. The E1 component gets small enough that its decay overwhelms its growth, and it starts uh, or it, its decay dominates, and it starts decaying and goes back to zero. So as time goes to infinity, because both eigenvector components are decaying to zero, the vector has to decay to zero. But at finite time, you can have large transient increases in the overall rate vector. So the moral is when the eigenvectors are not orthogonal, the dynamics in the eigenvector basis are deceiving because small vector components in poorly represented directions must be represented by cancellation of large eigenvector components. And therefore, as one of these large components decays away, it reveals another large component and can yield transient growth of the vector. Now you imagine this in 100 or 1,000 dimensions. You've got 1,000 things, 1,000 eigenvectors, large components canceling. One of them decays away and reveals something big. Another one decays away and reveals something big. So you can have arbitrarily complicated transient dynamics, although as time goes to infinity, everything needs to decay to zero. So how can we better understand the dynamics? The, um, the eigenvector picture is very nice because the two uh, components are decoupled from each other. Each one just decays away independent of what happens to the other one. But it's not very nice because it's not orthogonal, not an orthonormal basis. And so our intuitions are wrong. We intuit that when they decay, the rate vector should decay, and that is not what happens. So to better understand the dynamics, let's work in an orthonormal basis, where if we know what happens to the components in each basis vector, uh, then we have a good intuition for what will happen to the rate vector as a whole. So how do we build this orthonormal basis? Well, we start with the eigenvectors in some order, and we build an orthogonal representation by what's called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. I won't, call, won't go into that here, uh, starting with the eigenvectors. So the first basis vector is just the first eigenvector. So we'll call it the S plus sure basis vector, just exactly equal to E1. Um, and the component in that direction is R. We can find the components just by dot product because it's an orthonormal basis. So the, the uh, component in that direction is just proportional to the sum of the E and I activities. And now we take our second vector to be orthogonal to the first one. So it's in the one minus one direction. And our component in that direction is proportional to the difference between the excitatory and inhibitory activities. And so then with this uh, weight vector, we can see that as we saw before, WS plus is lambda one times S plus, and WS minus, if you work it out, is W times one plus KI times S plus. Well, we'll call that W feed forward for reasons you'll see in a minute. And so we call that, so that is equal to W feed forward times S plus. So we, you, you put in something in the S minus direction in the difference direction between E and I, and out comes something in the sum direction, both E and I moving together. And so in the S plus S minus basis, W looks like this. It has lambda one, that's how an S plus drives S plus. W feed forward, that's how an S minus drives S plus. And then zero, because uh, neither S plus nor S minus gives you a component in the S minus direction. This is actually lambda one w feed forward lambda two, but lambda two is equal to zero. So the picture we have here is one pattern, the E minus I direction, which is giving a feed forward weight driving the E plus I direction. And that direction is inhibiting itself with weight lambda one. 
And this direction is modifying itself with weight lambda 2, but that is equal to 0. So we call this a feedforward weight because it only goes in one direction. There's a connection from pattern A to pattern B, but there's no loop back by which pattern B can drive pattern A. Uh, and the significance of this is that the difference between excitatory and inhibitory activities is driving a sum of excitatory and inhibitory activities, meaning that if you tilt the balance of E and I a little bit towards E, you will drive up both E and I. And if you tilt the balance a little bit towards I, you will drive down this, this sum, both E and I. Uh, and that's like the paradoxical response. We tilt the balance towards I, and both E and I end up being driven down. And if W is strong, so that W feed forward is strong, uh, then that's a very strong effect. A small change in the difference will cause a large change in the sum. So we can solve the equation in the uh, Schur basis, in the S plus S minus basis. So in that basis, the equations are <clears throat> the change in R plus is negative R plus plus lambda 1 times itself plus W feet forward times R minus. And that R minus simply change, decays uh, and grows according to its eigenvalue, which happens to be 0. Um, so we can solve this. The R minus equation is easy to solve. That's just an exponential decay from its initial condition. <clears throat> the R plus con uh, solution is that its initial condition decays uh, according to its eigenvalue. Uh, but in addition, it integrates its input, and its input in this case is R minus. So it's integrating R minus of t with the same exponential kernel. Um, and, but we know what this R minus of t is. Here it is up here. So we plug that in. Here's R minus of 0. Here's the exponential. Uh, and we get this integral here, which we can solve. We get a function that we call g lambda 1 lambda 2 of t, uh, which is shown here and illustrated here. And what this is, is a, it's a pulse function, as you see. Uh, essentially, if um, lambda 2 is greater than lambda 1, then lambda 1 as we have here, then lambda 1 will decay away more quickly. And so you'll have a rise with time course given by tau over 1 minus lambda 1. And then uh, the initial exponential will decay away, and you'll have a fall with time constant determined by lambda 2. And it's divided by the difference between these two lambdas. So the result of that pulse function uh, is uh, what you see here now, the same dynamics that we showed in the eigenvector basis, we now look at in the S plus and S minus basis. S plus is in this direction, the sum of E and I activity, and S minus is in this direction, the difference between E and I activity. Um, and our initial condition is right here, which is represented by this much S minus and this much S plus, uh, just perpendicular projections. And then as time progresses, S minus monotonically decays, so you're moving monotonically in that direction. But S plus first grows through that pulse function and then gradually decays back to zero. And so you have S minus decaying, S plus growing till it reaches the point where uh, it turns around and the pulse function turns around and it comes back to zero. So in the Sure basis and the orthogonal basis, knowing how each component behaves tells us how the vector behaves, which is not true in the eigenvector basis. So what are the implications of this for amplifying responses? Well, so we first consider uh, just a pulse of input that sets RE to 1 initially, the initial condition we started with before. And we're going to consider two circuits, either just an excitatory cell exciting itself or our EI circuit. Um, now, in blue is shown what happens if there's no recurrent connectivity, if all the Ws are zero. Uh, and so that's identical in the two cases. Now, with the recurrent connectivity present, then our E shows this pulse of activity, as we saw, uh, starting from this initial condition. Um, and in this case, the W slows down, W being a positive connection, positive eigenvalue, if you want, uh, slows down the decay. Uh, and so we we have a much we have more activity because it lasts a lot longer, not because it goes higher. So if we then look at what happens to a, a steady state input, a sustained input, um, well, 
At any given time, the response to this sustained input is the integral of this pulse response. And so it's the area under the curve up to that point in time. So in this case, that area accumulates fairly quickly and it, the uh, response rises up quickly to much higher than the level it would have without any recurrence. And if we scale up this blue to be the same height as the red as shown in blue dashed, we see it goes up almost as fast as the response goes up in the absence of any recurrence. Um, so unlike the usual intuition that recurrent effects are slower, in this case, the recurrent amplification can happen basically as quickly as the feedforward drive. And if both eigenvalues had been negative, this could even be faster than the feedforward response. On the other hand, in the Hebbian case, the integral is bigger simply because the dynamics are, sl is slower, are slower. Uh, so the slowing of the dynamics and the amplifying of the response to a steady state input are one and the same thing. They're not two different aspects, they're one and the same thing. Because you're slowed, you have a bigger integral, and so you integrate up to a larger response, but you integrate very slowly because that integral is spread out over time. So uh, if we now look at greater and greater degrees of amplification, with 100% being the maximum in each case, um, what you see is that here, the more we amplify, the slower and slower our dynamics get. But here, the more we amplify, in fact, the dynamics get faster, so that with the largest amplification, it's basically exactly as fast as without any recurrence at all. And again, if both eigenvalues have been negative, it could be even faster. So the result of the balanced amplification is that when E and I weights are both strong, uh, but they're balanced so that you, you, you're you dominated by your feedforward inputs uh, or your and your eigenvalues are either zero or negative, then you can have a large amplification of response through that feedforward weight, those feedforward weights, without any slowing of the dynamics. What's the general result when we go to higher than two dimensions? Well, the connectivity matrix W has non-orthogonal eigenvalues, which means it, it's called being a non-normal matrix, if it doesn't commute with its transpose. And for biological connection matrices, they are non-normal because they have excitatory units and inhibitory units. So it has positive or zero columns and negative or zero columns. And that means that you can just see the signs of the four quadrants are different between one uh, WWT and WTW. So they are non-normal. Um, and for a non-normal matrix, the simplest form of the matrix, simplest form you can make the matrix under a transformation to an orthonormal basis is upper triangular, the eigenvalues on the diagonal and what we call the feed forward weights above the diagonal. This is called the sure decomposition. They're feed forward because they're all above the diagonal, so they only go in one direction. There's no loop, loops back. And so there's a hidden feed forward connectivity in any recurrent connectivity matrix. If excitation and inhibition are both strong, then feed forward weights will be strong. If they're also balanced, that eigenvalues are small, then feedforward dynamics will dominate. So in the eigenvector picture, you have independent patterns, each, uh, each evolving according to its own eigenvalue, independent of all the others. That's a very nice mathematical picture, but it doesn't give us a good intuition because of the fact that large components may have to cancel to make something small, and then the large components can be revealed as some of the other large components decay away. In the sure picture, we have different components that uh, connect to themselves by their eigenvalues, but there also is a pattern of feed-forward connections between them. And if the eigenvalues are weak, then you're basically just a feed-forward network. And for EI networks, what I showed you before is very typical, that difference patterns, patterns in which excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons have firing rates of opposite signs about whatever fixed point you're linearizing about, drive some patterns in which excitation and inhibition have the same sign. So again, as I said, a small tilting of the balance toward excitation causes a strong increase in both excitatory and inhibitory firing rates, and a tilt towards inhibition causes a strong decrease in excitatory and inhibitory firing rates, which is precisely the paradoxical response. Finally, the third thing I'm going to tell you about today is what we call the stabilized superlinear network, and this is going to be a very brief introduction. So the ISN is a linear effect. It only depends on behavior in the vicinity of the fixed point. For any network, linear or nonlinear, a given fixed point is an ISN if the excitation is unstable when inhibition is frozen at its fixed point value. But now we're going to look at a particular nonlinear network, the SSN, 
And this makes a transition from being a non-ISN for very weak input to being an ISN for stronger input. So let me show you how that works. The basic nonlinearity in the SSN is the nonlinear expansive or power law input output function of individual neurons. So what's shown here from Preby and Furster is uh, they, they looked at the membrane potential in 30 millisecond bins. This was a recording in an anesthetized cat V1, intracellular recording. The membrane potential in 30 millisecond bins and the corresponding firing rate in those 30 millisecond bins. And all those points are the gray points, which have a lot of Poisson noise in them. But when you, uh, <clears throat> when you bin in voltage bins, you get the blue points, which are very well fit by this curve, which is uh, the voltage uh, to a power of 2.79. So, and they typically find these powers to be in the range of two to five. The main thing is they're expansive. They have ever increasing derivatives. So we assume then a simple rate dynamics in which the nonlinearity in the rate dynamics is a power that the input, each element of the input is raised to, a, is, is rectified if it's set to zero if it's negative, and then it's raised to a power that's greater than one. And what does this do for you? It means that your gain, your change in your firing rate for a given change in input, if we regard the memory potential as being basically representative of the input, then the change in firing rate for a change in input is initially very small, and the gain is increasing the more active uh, the neuron is. So what does this do for you? Well, having increased gain means that you have increased effective synaptic strengths. Now, what do we mean by effective synaptic strengths? It means how much does the postsynaptic rate jiggle in response to the jiggling of the presynaptic rate? And that's a product of two terms, the synaptic strength, how much current do I inject, how much input do I give, and the gain, how much is the postsynaptic response to that given input? Uh, this is also what you get when you linearize about a fixed point. The linearized weights are the gain times the original weights. So this yields a transition with increasing input strength from a, a very weakly coupled or largely feed-forward driven regime when the gain is very, very small, weak activation, you have weak effective synaptic strengths, and that means that monosynaptic inputs dominate over di and polysynaptic inputs. Just like x squared is much less than x when x is very small, di and polysynaptic pathways are very weak compared to monosynaptic pathways when all the effective synapses are very small. And in this regime, you're a non-ISN. The E to E connectivity is very weak, so the excitatory subnetwork is stable by itself. And so here, the input is dominated by the external input because the monosynaptic input is the external input. And if we assume that when the external input goes to zero, the network activity goes to zero, then any recurrent input is di or polysynaptic because it requires an external input to activate a cortical cell to activate a recurrent connection. So the recurrent input is very suppressed compared to the external input, and so you're dominated by your external input. And that means now if I add two inputs, two input patterns, I just add their feedforward inputs. It's not modified much by the network. And then I put that through a superlinear input-output function, and so I would expect superlinear response summation. The response to two inputs should be more than the sum of the responses to the two individual inputs. And then it'll become linear, as we'll see, as the gains get stronger and as the recurrence begins to kick in, and then it'll become sublinear. So you transition from this weakly coupled regime to a more strongly coupled regime <clears throat> in which you have stronger activation, so you have stronger coupling, stronger effective strengths. And now, just as x squared is much bigger than x when x is much bigger than 1, the di and polysynaptic inputs start to dominate <clears throat> over the feedforward inputs, meaning the re recurrent inputs over the monosynaptic inputs, meaning the recurrent inputs start to dominate over the feedforward inputs. And in particular, the E to E connections get strong enough that the excitatory subnetwork could become un unstable by itself. But if the feedback inhibition is strong enough, the network will still go to a stable fixed point, but it then becomes an inhibition stabilized network. It's being stabilized at that fixed point by the inhibition. And it turns out that in order to stabilize against this very explosive nonlinearity, if you start to go unstable, you, your gain gets even bigger and you're even more unstable. In order to stabilize against this very explosive nonlinearity, the network has to conspire to do what we call loose balancing, meaning that the recurrent input has a term that cancels the feed forward and a leftover term that grows sublinearly as a function of the feed forward input. So the net input grows sublinearly as a function of the feedforward input. 
the linear component of the feedforward input is canceled. And we call it loose balancing because we're in a regime where the leftover is comparable in size to the things that cancel, as opposed to tight balance where the leftover is much, much smaller than the things that cancel. And that makes an important difference that allows for nonlinear behavior. And in this regime, you primarily are sublinearly summing. And I have to wave my hands here, but basically, when I add a second stimulus, most of the feedforward input it adds gets canceled. And it turns out that that leads, typically when you add two different stimuli, two different input patterns, typically leads to a sublinear summation. You get less than the sum of the responses that you would get to the two individual stimuli. So let me show you how this works. Here is the external input to a, a network like the one we just described, growing monotonically. It's the same as the x-axis. And here is the recurrent input, which initially is weaker. For very weak input, it's weaker than the external input. But it then turns around and grows negatively at almost exactly the same rate as that the external input grows positively. So that the net input, the sum of these two, shown in orange, levels off and grows very slowly, grows much, grows sublinearly as a function of the growth of the feedforward input. And in fact, it grows as the external input to the 1 over n power, where n is the power in the power law. And it's this cancellation of the linear part of the feedforward input that gives us the sublinear behavior that we see in this network. Given simple assumptions on the connectivity, that the connectivity decreases in strength with cortical difference, distance and with difference in preferred features, the SSN robustly accounts for a wide variety of cortical nonlinear behaviors. I'm just going to mention a few very quickly. You, you can look at the paper to see the details. Uh, there are a number of contrast dependent, meaning stimulus strength dependent nonlinearities uh, that are often summarized phenomenologically in normalization. These include what I just mentioned, that you have sublinear response summation uh, that becomes linear for weak stimuli uh, and also becomes winner take all for unequal strength stimuli. Uh, and you have surround suppression that becomes a surround facilitation for a weak center stimulus or an optimal stimulus size before you start surround suppressing that shrinks with increasing stimulus strength. So that regions in the surround that are uh, suppressing for stronger center stimuli are facilitating for weaker center stimuli. Um, you have increased dominance of a neuron's input by inhibition with increasing stimulus strength, a decrease in correlated neural variability with increasing stimulus strength, uh, that has certain tuning and timing, um, multiple ways in which attention modulates neural responses. So all of these all of these effects just come out of this simple mechanism of the uh, sublinear summation that results from the cancellation of the ex the loose cancellation of the external input. And finally, this is consistent with biological observation showing that the EI balance indeed is loose rather than tight. That the leftover after excitation inhibition cancel is comparable in size to the components that, can't, that are canceled. And that's everything I'm going to tell you today, and I refer you to the papers to learn more. Thank you.